The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. COVID-19 surged back in bigger numbers than ever this month in the province as complaints about pandemic restrictions and mixed messages grew louder. Tonight, does the Ontario government need a communications reset or something more? We'll debate that. Then, how did a serial killer go undetected by police for so long in Toronto's gay village? Author and journalist Justin Ling is here with his riveting new book detailing that story. It's Wednesday, October 28th, and that's next on The Agenda. These are tricky times for different parts of our province. In the provincial capital, the national capital, and York and Peel regions, we're in modified stage two. That's no gyms or bars or restaurants. But kids can go to school and people can attend dance classes. In the rest of Ontario, still in stage three, bubbles aren't really still a thing if they included school-aged children. And no one can gather indoors in groups of more than 10 unless it's in a staffed banquet hall. Is that all clear? Well, it isn't for some, maybe for many. That's why we've convened a group of our own experts to explain whether it's the policy or the communications that have some Ontarians scratching their heads about COVID-19 protocols right now. So let's welcome in Vancouver, British Columbia, Heidi Tvorek, Associate Professor of International History and Public Policy at the University of British Columbia. And here in the provincial capital in Harvard Village, Colin Furness, Infection Control Epidemiologist and an Assistant Professor at the Faculty of Information at the U of T, cross-appointed to the School of Public Health. In downtown Toronto, Amanda Galbraith, Principal at Navigator, formerly the Director of Communications to the current Mayor of Toronto. And in Leaside, Matt Gurney, National Post columnist and contributor to our own website, tvo.org. And it's great to have everybody on our program tonight. I want to just start by getting sort of 30 seconds from each of you grading Ontario's communication strategy around COVID-19 right now. So give us sort of the, the banner headlines and then we'll go deeper. Amanda, start us off. <laughs> of course you're going to me first. You're the communications uh, guru. <laughs> Thank you for the title. Uh, listen, I'd give, them, I'd give them a B to a C. And I think probably part of the thing is we have a premier who I think, um, you know, has done quite well through this and that he is inspiring uh, empathy. People feel like he's fighting for them. But at the same time, we have, I think, a public medical officer of health and a medical system itself the inherited contradictory. We've had public fights. And as you mentioned, there's some policies that are incredibly frankly, they make no sense. So I, you know, they're doing their best, but I think there's a lot of challenges that they're, uh, they're facing. Colin Furness. I give them somewhere between a D and an F. I, I agree that Premier Ford has done his best to, to appeal uh, and to seem empathetic, but he doesn't understand the instructions he's giving. And we know that from Mother's Day, and we know that from instances since, that he doesn't, he can't actually make sense of it himself. And I think it's really hard to persuade people when you can't be clear about what it is you're trying to say. Matt Gurney. Uh, I would say a C in trending down. I think the communications were better earlier. I think ever since we started getting schools reopen again, we started talking about it. As you've already mentioned, bubbles and whatnot. The communications have fallen apart since then. And we're at the point where I'm someone who's engaged in this. It's my job to follow it along. I, I follow it out of personal and professional interest. Half the time, I have no idea if what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing or not. So a muddled start and getting worse since. Heidi Turek. Uh, so I'd say probably, I guess, if I've got to grade as a professor, a C to a D, particularly in comparison to all the other countries that I've studied around the world and their communications. It can be clearer. It can be more effective. You could have one communicator. It is a massive problem if people who are engaged in this really have no idea what they're doing. Well, Heidi, let me stick with you for a second here. Compare and contrast, if you would, then, since you do examine how other countries and other jurisdictions are doing this, what do you like about what others are doing that you do not see happening here in Ontario? 
Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, one thing we saw in places like South Korea or New Zealand, for example, is there's a very clear split between the public health officials who are providing public health guidelines and then the politicians, only one usually, who's helping to make sense of exactly what's happening, so giving it a deeper kind of democratic meaning. And in Ontario, we see too many communicators sometimes contradicting each other. So that's one thing. Another is even simple things like the metaphors that are used to describe what's happening. Uh, we basically advise against uh, military military metaphors, uh, which has been very heavily used by Premier Ford. Instead, we think things like, for example, a relay race, as South Korea talks about it, something that everybody has to engage in together. That's actually much more effective in motivating people to comply rather than this kind of authoritarian top-down messaging. Amanda, do you agree it's a problem that we have the Premier offering advice, we have senior cabinet ministers offering advice, we have senior health officials on television every day, almost every day offering advice? Is that problematic? I would say any communicator I've talked to would think that politicians and in general people are overexposed on this, right? I mean, they've set up a paradigm where they're up every day. Uh, you know, he's getting some electoral benefit out of that. But you know, the real challenge here is that unlike, say, a BC where Dr. Bonnie Henry is, you know, she's a de facto head of the public health for the province, um, you have you know, 34, 33 different chiefs all over the place, right, who are contradicting each other, sometimes publicly fighting with the premier, as we saw with Eileen de Villa in Toronto, confusing the public greatly. Um, so I think it is really, truly a challenge, yes, that there's not one unified message, but the system itself is set up so that can't even occur. So even if the government had the best communication strategy, they would actually don't have the mechanism to deploy it. Well, let me follow up with Colin on that, because uh, when I think public health in the capital city, I think Eileen de Villa. I, I don't think of a whole bunch, a bunch of other people, I think of her. When I think of public health at the provincial level, you know, six or seven or eight names come to mind. Do you think that's a problem, Colin? It's a huge problem. I sampled uh, media communications, media coverage across Canada and determined that in Ontario, 88% of the communication is coming from elected politicians. That's the highest in the country. Quebec is next. And so we, we do see a match between the mess that we have and the fact that politicians are trying to craft the message. I think public health always works best uh, when it's conceived and implemented locally. I don't see a problem with having 34 different regional public health units. The problem is that they don't actually have the authority to, do, to make decisions. So we end up having public scrapping. We end up having Toronto having to beg uh, for safety measures that we desperately need. And, and that is a huge problem. That is, the, it turns this into political management instead of pandemic management. Matt, is that to say that we should have had an equivalent of Bonnie Henry basically being the singular message carrier from day one? That's actually a, a really interesting question. And, and that maybe we should have in a, in a world where we can do that, but we don't live in that world. We live in a federation where we have a federal government with a prime minister who gave daily press conferences, with a federal public health authority who gave frequent press conferences. We have a province, obviously, as we've noted, with not only its own public health system, but with numerous people representing it. We also live in a province where we've had a lot of media consolidation in recent years. So a lot of the news Ontarians watch will come out of Toronto, where, you know, they may be 100, 200 kilometers away, but they're watching local Toronto news, where local Toronto public health officials are coming out and making statements or giving orders that are relevant for the 416. You know, some of the issues that if you travel, again, 45 minutes, an hour by car outside of Toronto, you might have passed through two or three different public health regimes by the time you reach your final destination. If you're just a citizen, you're busy, you got your kids at home, because the schools were closed last year. They're doing online learning this year. You're working from home. You're trying to do the responsible thing. You're trying to be informed and engaged. And you watch three different press conferences over the course of an afternoon, one from the feds, one from the province, one from the big city two hours away you don't even live in. I don't think it's any surprise that people are ending up confused. Well, let me follow up on this issue of consistency of message. And, and uh, let me preface it by saying this is not a show that intends to name and shame. That's not what we're about here. However, one can't help but notice that there have been a couple of very prominent examples this past week of politicians not necessarily modeling the best behavior in the midst of this pandemic. And I'll get our director, Shelton Osmond, if you would, to bring up this first picture here. This has obviously gone viral. This is Sam Osterhoff, uh, who's a member of the Ontario Legislature from the Niagara Peninsula. He's the MPP for Niagara West. He's the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Education. And, and he did come under a real torrent of criticism for a picture that he initially posted uh, and then deleted earlier this week. Uh, 
Be group indoors, no physical distancing, nobody wearing masks, despite the fact that we're told that the staff at this event constantly told them to put masks on. Uh, the Premier, I guess understandably, given that he's a kid in his 20s, frankly, the Premier has said, you know, he's young, he made a mistake, I'm not going to fire him, and, and I'm going to be forgiving. But I guess, Heidi, let's get into this here. What kind of message um, does it send when the people who are the decision makers aren't following the, the protocols of their own decisions? This is an excellent question. And actually, we have a very good example of how harmful this can be in another place uh, where I'm from, the United Kingdom, where Dominic Cummings, the special advisor to the prime minister, quite early in the summer was seen to be breaking some of the rules. And in fact, a study in The Lancet um, found that this had really undermined how much British people wanted to conform with the guidelines. They called this the Cummings effect because people felt that it was one rule for politicians and elites and another rule for them. So I think we have to be very, very careful with situations like this. Um, in other jurisdictions like New Zealand, for example, or Scotland, when leaders or health officials contravene the rules, they actually ended up resigning. So there are examples uh, in both directions. And I think we should be very cognizant of the fact that people are tired and they are frustrated. And if people in leadership positions are seen to be given different dispensations than other people, it would be very hard to get the population to continue to comply. Yeah, Colin, I'm just wondering what signal you think it sends when the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Education, I mean, if you're a teacher, if you're a caretaker in a school, if you're a student in a school, a principal, and you see the, the PA to the Minister of Education doing this, what message do you take from it? I think it's really undermining, and my mind goes back to Mother's Day, the day after Mother's Day, when the Premier himself stood up and proudly announced how he had his extended family from multiple households to his house, because they were all in the same immediate family tree. He didn't understand the difference between relationships and households, and he was flabbergasted. He wasn't sneaking around. He literally didn't understand, didn't understand the rules, and didn't actually apologize for it either. He just shrugged and said, oh, I've gotten some trouble for that. I think that was undermining, and that, that was back in May. He's not the only one, Sam Mosterhoff, to have done something uh, perhaps ill-advised this past week, and we're going to show another picture here. Uh, the protocols are that when you're in an airport, you should keep your mask on. There's the Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, the Federal Minister of Health, at Pearson Airport. Now, when she was asked about this, she said, well, I was just about to have some food and drink, and therefore I had to take my mask off. And some people have observed that there does not appear to be any food or drink in that picture. Okay, Amanda, problematic? <laughs> yeah, to say the least, I think for either of them, right? She's the, this to me, they're both bad, um, but this to me is, is brutal. She's the health minister trying to urge us all to publicly do this. And I think as part of that, especially when you're a politician, you know you've got to be better than just standard, right? You've got to go above and beyond. And yeah, maybe she took her mask off early before the food came, but that's not good enough. Um, and we have to hold our elected officials to standard. People aren't seeing their families for months on end. We you know we have um, parents, or grandparents not seeing their grandkids. Um, you know, people losing their jobs and elected officials are naming, shaming people all the time, calling them yahoos, saying COVID, like, all that kind of messaging to me just turns people off and then this makes it worse. Matt, do you have a, a, a little tender sweet spot for the transgressions of these politicians? I don't. I, I do see some difference between them. Um, for for the federal health minister, obviously by virtue of her position uh, and being a high public you know, profile person, she ought to have known better. I mean, I think the the health minister by by any standard needs to be held to the maximum highest standard. For Mr. Oosterhoff, uh, perhaps not quite as high a standard, but the optics of the photo were just so egregiously terrible. I'm not seeing my parents right now. I'm not seeing my my grandmother because my kids are in school. And I don't know what they're exposed to there. To see a whole family reunion, even though, again, I don't hold them to as high a standard, it just felt like much more of a knife twist than what I'd seen with the federal health minister. Now, Heidi, you gave us the example from the United Kingdom. We don't seem in this, on this continent anyway, to, um, well, ministerial resignations are pretty bloody rare these days. But do you think these transgressions warrant resignations by the, either of these politicians? Oh, it's a tough question. I mean, in, in some cases, it was multiple transgressions, but I think it just also spoke to uh, places that really wanted to hold their leaders to the highest standards and to have examples for the population. So this was just one of many different ways in which, for example, New Zealand's communication was so incredibly strong. So I think it's always tricky to say from another context, X should resign or Y should resign. Um, but one other thing to add is that um, places where politicians admitted mistakes and apologized actually ended up with increased trust. So the Norwegian Prime Minister 
Ernest Solberg said at some point in the summer, you know, she regretted that she had done such a strict lockdown. It turned out that wasn't necessary. And admitting that mistake actually ended up strengthening Norwegian's trust in her. So I think that's also something that we can take away. Admitting mistakes is not a bad thing, it can really increase trust. And so can apologizing, sort of basic things we all learn at five years old in <laughs> primary school. I would like to ask Colin about something that may or may not happen three days from now. Uh, we have been told that masks, physical distancing, and of course being outdoors are ways to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Halloween, you would think, would check off all of those boxes, and yet the last we heard, Halloween is sort of being canceled this year in the province of Ontario, at least in the, in the areas where we're in stage, modified stage two. Do you think that's the right call? I think it was a heartbreaking call. I am, I am really saddened by that, not only as a parent, but also because I was one spending months pleading with the province to close restaurants and bars on the basis of evidence. And they kept saying, we don't have enough data yet. And Halloween is canceled with absolutely no data whatsoever. I think that's dispiriting and disheartening at precisely at a time where we all could use a sign of resilience, where we could all use a little bit of joy and, and have a project to actually work on in terms of how to do this safely. That would have brought people together. And I think it was a giant mistake. Matt, you've got kids, yes? I do, and they're exactly the age where losing Halloween is the worst possible thing they can imagine. They were asking months ago, will, will Halloween be back? We, we've improvised something uh, with other families in the neighborhood, families uh, where we're already exposed to them because our, our kids are in the same class. So we feel as though we can pull something off. Uh, we'll do a scavenger hunt. Where they will, they'll be out in their costumes. So they will get a Halloween experience this year. But I'd, I'd mentioned uh, to your producer before, Steve, I live in a neighborhood that tends to go a little bonkers for Halloween. Like, just like the decorations are always crazy. People drive through our neighborhood to look at it. You're not seeing much of that this year. And I think that's, a, you're seeing some of it, but I think there's just a reflection on the behalf, uh, behalf of my neighbors. I don't know them, but I drive by a house. I'm like, oh, these guys normally by now would have their huge inflatable whatever set up and it's not there this year. It's like putting out a, a sign saying, hey, we're open for business. And this year we're not seeing those signs. Hmm. Heidi, I, I have no doubt but that if people were literally dropping like flies in the streets, the public would completely understand that Halloween has to be cancelled. But since that's not happening, do you think that governments have adequ adequately made the case that Halloween needs to be cancelled because things are just a little too much on the precipice? So I think I'd take a step back and say this is a trap that Ontario sort of set for itself, right? By always issuing very, very granular guidelines for every single holiday. They make people now expect that they're going to be told, should I do Halloween? How should I do it? You know, we saw this with Thanksgiving. Um, and another approach is to say, look, the virus doesn't take a holiday. You know, it's not like diets where you can have a cheat day. In fact, you know, you have to conceive of your Halloween activities in the same way as you would any other activity. And if you can find a way to do that safely um, outdoors, for example, then that's one way of doing it. And I think that's where the example of BC is very helpful. There are guidelines. Uh, people don't sort of hang on the word of what to do for Halloween or Thanksgiving as much because they recognize if you're going to do an event, you have to do it within the parameters of the usual guidelines. And so that, I think, more broadly, is a communications reset that would be incredibly helpful. So, Amanda, help, help us understand then what the communication strategy ought to have been here. If you've decided as a government that, that doing Halloween is simply too dangerous for the young people and maybe the parents and grandparents that they potentially could infect, have they adequately, in your view, made the case that would convince people that Halloween needed to be cancelled? No, I actually think this, like, from a policy perspective, is an idiotic decision. I'm not going to play armchair doctor here. But in far as communicating it, also, it's it's this attitude now because they don't have the data to back it up, right? It's just do as we say because we know better. And I think the public is turning off of that. They're frustrated. They don't understand because the rules are so contradictory. Sam Oosterhoff can go to a banquet hall and, and, you know, party with 50 people. But my kids can't go trick-or-treating safely outside when they're masked. Um, so I, I think the way they communicated this, uh, frankly, I, I was not a fan of it. I thought the graphics that they put out uh, were ridiculous and also quite tone deaf. Um, and I think they turned off a lot of the public and parents who have trying to be patient because if we can't manage an outdoor event uh, that's masked while people are staying in their family units, how are we going to manage Christmas? How are we going to manage 
you know, the next year, because this is not going away. And right now we don't have a sustainable, this is how we're planning to live our lives for the next year. We have a, we make decisions one week at a time. And people are just tuning out and doing what they want to do. Hmm. Colin, obviously in this job, uh, I, I get lots of emails and phone calls from people asking me questions and telling me their experiences. And, and I'll just repeat one that I have heard probably more than any other one recently, and then get you to weigh in on this. Uh, once upon a time when the province reopened gymnasiums, uh, hockey rinks, uh, fitness facilities, they did not require mask use, and then we had outbreaks, and then they shut everything down. Um, well, in, those, in the four jurisdictions where we've gone to modified stage two. But then they reopened dance studios. And of course, schools are still open with 30 kids in a class where there are 30 desks, and you know they're not two meters apart. But movie theaters are shut down where even if 10 people are in a cinema of 250 seats, that's unacceptable. Can you please make sense of all of that for us? Nobody can make sense of that. Um, there's too much internal inconsistency. There ought to have been one simple rule applied starting from Labor Day, if not earlier, which is unless you live in the same household, you do not be indoors with anyone without a mask. Full stop. And for situations where you might be in a larger place with people for some period of time, then we need to work out guidelines for that. For example, movie theaters. But the way the rules have been announced and enacted, uh, not based on evidence at all, not based on emerging evidence, and not explained to people. So no, I, I'm afraid I cannot make sense of those. Heidi, do you see either simplicity or consistency in any of those decisions from the province of Ontario? Uh, not really, to be honest. I mean, it's it's a massive problem that people can't understand the guiding philosophy behind why some things are open and shut. Hmm. Matt, how about you? I've written a column about this for TVO.org where I talked about the emails I get from all the various extracurricular or athletic activities my kids are involved in. Not only can I make sense of it, the people who have to make sense of it can't make sense of it. One example I noted was that my uh, my eight-year-old daughter go well went to a gymnastics program that was indoors, and they were shut down when we went to modified stage two. But it took about a week for the owners of the gymnastics studio to figure out if they, under the law, were a gym, which is the root... <laughs> you know, which is adapted from gymnastics, or if they were an indoor recreation facility. And it, depending on which one they were legally, different rules and conditions would have applied. And it took them about a week to to figure this out. I was getting constant, almost daily emails from them going, we don't know if we're open. We don't know if we're open. And they eventually decided that they were not open. They eventually did close down. But if you have good faith efforts by business owners and facility operators to figure out what the rules are, and it needs seven to 10 days and meetings with city officials and their local MPPs to do it, that's a sign of a system that is simply not working. The top doc in this province is David Williams. He's the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario. Let's listen to a little bit of something he recently had to say about these issues. Sheldon, if you would. In the first wave, when they did case contact management, they had an average of 10 to 12 people that were contacts of the case. Now they say it's quite common to have 50 to 60 to 70, even up to 100 of a case. That's saying the last five to seven days you were in close contact with. And my thinking is, I don't understand that. Why would you have that kind of thing? What did you not understand about our messaging? And if you get a sense, there's a, some of a frustration, because to me, the messaging has been said and said again. It's so clear. It's obvious. Amanda, the messaging is so clear. It's obvious. As a communication strategy, would you recommend that to a client? Uh, no. And, you know, I'm sure I, I, I very... I know Dr. David Williams is working very hard um, behind the scenes, as all the people uh, there are. But I think, um, you know, anyone who's watched his press conferences, and I've watched more than a few, uh, would admit that communications is not his strong suit. Um, and I think that's one of the big problems here is we get clips like this, which are, I mean, there's this, there's the gif of Julia Roberts, like, looking at the ceiling, trying to figure out what, like, math equations going around. I cannot make either tail of, of what he says half the time. And part of what happens then is that then shifts the burden of communication onto the politicians who are driven by the whims of different regions and different electoral districts. And of course, I think politicians have a role to play in making these calls, but not to have a strong person to be able to communicate with you from a medical perspective, I think is really hurting us as a province. Um, and it's forcing a lot of this on political actors who frankly aren't equipped to make these kind of calls either. Colin, what's your view of Dr. Williams' communication abilities? 
I think his poor communication isn't the problem, it's a symptom of the problem. I don't think he understands public health the way we need him to. He doesn't seem to understand testing strategy. He definitely doesn't understand social network theory and bubbling. His recommendations run counter to first principles and common sense so often that it would be impossible for anyone, I think, to explain that really clearly. Uh, since July, I've been asking him to vacate his office. He is not up to the job based on the experience and expertise he does not have. Okay, let's, uh, Sheldon, can I ask you for a four shot here? Can we see all the guests at once? Can I see a show, okay, Colin has gone on the record here, a as he has for many months. Can I see a show of hands? How many people think the medical officer of health for the province of Ontario ought to be replaced immediately? Hands up, please. Okay, Colin's got a hand up. I see Heidi is uh, on the fence. The other two are not. Matt, how come you're not calling for his resignation? I, I'm not convinced there's anyone better to replace him with at this time. If you look uh, coast to coast across this country, we've had two standout public health officers uh, in BC and Alberta. And in the second wave, both those provinces are struggling. Uh, they were they did fairly well in the first wave. They're taking it on the chin this wave. I, if I was confident there was someone better waiting in the wings that we could, uh, you know, yank uh, Dr. Williams, send him off to a well-earned retirement and put in someone new, I would do it. Like, you know me, Steve, I don't mind firing a hockey coach if the season's not going the way it needs to. I don't, I don't mind doing that at all. But I would need to be convinced that that would lead to an upgrade. And I would think right now there is absolutely a very real chance that it would take a bad situation and make it worse. I don't assume the problems in Ontario right now are the result of Dr. Williams. And I do not assume that removing him would immediately make any improvement. We're in the middle of a second wave right now. And sometimes you go to war with the soldiers you have, not the ones you want. And for better or worse, here we are. We're in this thing. Heidi, you, you sort of uh, put your hands up as if to say, I'm sort of on the fence about this one. Uh, wh why, why were you not categorical in your willingness to dismiss Dr. Williams? So I think it's it's always tempting to focus on a single person and not to think about structures, as Amanda pointed out. So one way to think about this is it's also possible to just do a reset of your communications and say, OK, we really need to sort of rethink this. It's clearly not going as well as we hoped. Who can we appoint as the top one or two communicators who can very clearly explain things and let some people inevitably then take a step back? In South Korea, for example, one of the top doctors, um, she actually communicated by not communicating. So she said, I'm simply too busy uh, dealing with this crisis to actually do anything other than occasional single press conferences. So there are ways of communicating that don't involve uh, sitting in front of the press, appointing someone who's actually really skilled in communication to bring those messages forward. And I'd also add, put them on social media and meet people where they're at, which I think has been a bit of a weakness in, in much of the communication across Canada. Colin, at the Premier's daily briefing, he is frequently asked about whether or not he still has confidence in Dr. Williams, and he goes to the wall for Dr. Williams. He says, not only do I have confidence in him, but he's, I think the expression he uses is, Dr. Williams is working his back off. I call him at all hours of the day and night. Uh, he is there. He is offering good advice. If the Premier has confidence in him, should that be good enough for the rest of us? I think the Premier is the only person I've heard defending his, his conduct and his capacity. Um, I don't think this is a communications problem. I think it's a confidence problem. I think it's a decision-making problem. And again, you're making bad decisions. There's no effective way to communicate that to make things work. Uh, I think he's been effective for the Premier because this has been handled as a political problem in Ontario. And you don't want a strong public health leader if you're determined to manage this like a political problem. This is why there's no advanced planning. This is why the decision-making really doesn't make sense when you're trying to keep people safe. So I can completely understand why the Premier has full confidence in him, but I do believe he's the only one who does. Okay, in our last couple of minutes here, Matt, let me ask you, uh, a year ago, if we were having this conversation, uh, first of all, we wouldn't be talking about COVID, but we would be talking about how terrible the Premier's polling numbers were. A year later, he's one of the most popular Premiers in the entire country. Can he not say, look at Matt Gurney, you may not like where things are at right now, but the public seems to have confidence in me, and I've got confidence in David Williams, so back off a little bit, Buster. Well, he can say that. How many people will, will listen to him? I suppose we would uh, have to, <laughs> we'd find out. Um, what, what I would say is this, and I actually do find that a fascinating question. I was talking recently with friends who I had over at my house uh, for a dinner party on New Year's Eve. Doesn't seem that long ago. In objective adult terms, it wasn't that long ago. All of the things we were doing, we would not do. I had people from six different households under my roof. There was no masking. Like the world changed on us very quickly, and it was obviously to the benefit of, of Mr. Ford. Um, 
we as Canadians have the danger we always do is that we will get so mesmerized by what's happening south of the border, it will be almost impossible for us to have an objective measurement of how we are doing. So right now, as long as the United States continues to struggle, any Canadian politician is going to look good almost by default. When we broaden that out to an international reckoning, obviously Canada doesn't look as good. We are not the worst, but we are certainly not the best. And even within Canada, like I said before, in the first wave, Ontario and Quebec struggled. The second wave looks more complicated. So Doug Ford, whatever you think of him, I think he has a defense to make, even if it is that other people are doing just as badly. And Amanda, if you were able to get yourself in a room with Doug Ford right now, sit down with him and his chief of staff and maybe his top health, health people, health policy advisors, Give them one piece of advice that you think he, notwithstanding how well he's doing in the polls, that you think he ought to be changing up to do even better. I think if I were them, I'd focus on testing and communicating that we are moving forward with that. Um, I think they need to set clear parameters. But the problem is, is that we don't have clear parameters of how to make decisions. So instead, we look to the government to decide if we can cancel Halloween or Thanksgiving or Mother's Day. Um, if they set a clear set of guidelines that say, if you know, for example, no don't be in groups above 10. If you're with people that aren't in your house, you must wear a mask. And that's where people can actually logically apply their own lens to it. Then you get out of this constant, you know, cut and thrust and, and push and pull from the public around, you know, these heart wrenching issues of family. So I think that's where they have to get eventually. I would also suggest they pull back from the daily press conferences, but uh, my, my bet is that's not going to happen for a very long time. Uh, they can't, resist their, they can't uh, resist their close up, Mr. DeMille. Anyway, that's an old reference to an old movie that uh, goes way back before, way before your time, Amanda, but there we go. I remember it, though. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. That's Amanda Galbraith. I want to thank Matt Gurney, Colin Furness, Heidi Tvorek. It's great of all of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Eight men over seven years, starting in 2010, disappeared without a trace from Toronto's gay village. Lives taken, it turns out, by a predator operating in the midst of a vibrant community where fears mounted even as police came up short. Investigative journalist Justin Ling covered this story as it was unfolding, but his new book goes further, probing what made such a shocking loss of life possible. It's called Missing from the Village, the story of serial killer Bruce MacArthur, the search for justice, and the system that failed Toronto's queer community. And Justin Ling joins us now from Montreal, Quebec, for his first time on the agenda. Long overdue, but happy to see you on the other end of that television screen. Justin, how are you doing? I'm doing as well as could be expected, given the circumstances, Steve. Thanks for having me on. That, that is actually the right answer to that question. Very good. <laughs> uh, I guess I want to start, before we actually tell the story, I want to know what drew you particularly to this story. Yeah, I mean, I actually recount the moment when I decided to start reporting on the story in the book, and I remember it actually very, very vividly. It was a moment actually sitting in Parliament um, in my former office on the third floor of Centre Block, and it was in the middle of an election campaign, and I was just struck by this image of a headline that I had seen a couple of years earlier about men who had started going who started going missing in the Church and Wellesley village in Toronto and I remember at the time in 2013 thinking something is really wrong here you know it, it's not every day that um, you know three men who look really similar all three were were brown-skinned uh, immigrants um, you know all three of them were queer all three of them went to the same bars it's not every day that people with that many similarities go missing from a small geographic area over a small time frame and I remember thinking back then, God, I hope they catch the guy. And in 2015, going back and looking through all those headlines again, there had been no update. There was no conclusion. There was no press conference by police a year later or two years later. There was no follow-up by the Toronto Star or the Globe and Mail. There was nothing. Two years of just absolute radio silence. I would learn later that the investigation had been shut down in 2014 and that nobody was looking into this. This had been completely just left to lie fallow in a filing cabinet somewhere. So it was in that moment I thought, well, someone needs to go back and revisit this. Something is wrong here. And if someone is responsible for those disappearances, they could do it again. They might still be doing it. They might still be potentially abducting or killing people 
in the gay village. And, you know, somebody needs to ring the alarm bell on that. All journalists, all reporters, they want to tell important stories, and this is clearly an important story. Did you feel, though, that as a gay man, you had either particular insight or entree into this story that others might not have? I think to some degree, yes. But I think the biggest part was just knowing that it's unusual for people to disappear from the village in that way. I can tell you that part of the assumption from investigating officers and from folks at the Toronto Police Service was that gay men or queer men or closeted men sometimes just take off. It really was this assumption that maybe because they were immigrants or refugees, maybe because they were queer or in the closet, that maybe they'd head back, and I'm going to use really aggressive scare quotes here, go back home or head back home, or that maybe they would just get in the car or hop on a bus and just go to some other life somewhere. And it just seemed to be this innate belief that that's what some queer people do. And, you know, as a queer person, as someone who, you know, spent a lot of time in the village in Montreal and Toronto and elsewhere, I can tell you that doesn't happen. I mean, home is the village. I mean, that's what drew these men to Church and Wellesley with a sense of community, with a sense of collective protection, with a sense of collective belonging. And the idea that they would just flee just it struck me as so absurd. So maybe that is, you know, my entry as a queer person, knowing how bizarre it would be for someone to flee that sense of safety. Um, but you know, in many respects, I think what I brought to this was just, you know, my journalism experience, right? It shouldn't take a queer person to look at that story and say something is really wrong here. You know, there was no innate knowledge I had as a gay man that that told me there was something particularly off here. It was just knowing that when you don't, um, you know, properly investigate outstanding missing persons cases, especially ones that look so similar, you end up letting serial killers go undetected. We learned that in the downtown east side of Vancouver. So, you know, that is the sort of experience that I brought into this story. I think me being a queer person certainly helped. I don't think it defined my coverage of it, no. Well, let me pick up on that angle of the serial killer, because I think it was, well, it's almost four years ago now that you, when you were working at Vice Magazine, looked at the, the facts around this story and said, there's a serial killer at work here, and the police were not anywhere close to using that word yet. What were you seeing that they clearly were not? Well, you know, I'll go back to the to the Picton example. You know, what uh, the commission that was conducted after uh, Robert Picton was ultimately arrested said was when you have folks disappearing unusually and with no trace who bear certain, you know, characteristics, either um, indigenous status, sexuality, profession, in, uh, involvement in the sex trade. Um, when you see people disappear one after the other with no explanation, it tends to point to the idea that someone's targeting them. People generally in this country do not disappear without a trace. It's actually relatively uncommon that you have long-term missing persons cases with no indication whatsoever of what happened. It is relatively rare. So to have in Toronto these three cases of three men, all of whom were South Asian or Middle Eastern, all of whom were in their 40s or 50s, all of whom were gay, bisexual, otherwise queer, all of whom went to the same bars, used the same dating apps, knew the same people, but didn't know each other. To have all of those similarities, you'd have to come up with such an elaborate set of coincidences to explain how each one of them could go missing independently of each other and have them not be connected. So fundamentally, my argument was the most likely explanation, as as you know, almost horrifying as it is, the most likely explanation is a serial killer. And unfortunately, I was right. But it shouldn't take you know someone from the outside coming in and pointing that out. This is what we learned from numerous examples from Vancouver and from elsewhere throughout North America and Europe is that when you have people who do disappear with, with no trace whatsoever, with all these similarities, it does tend to point to the idea that someone's targeting them. Well, that does raise questions about the, you know, the decades-long rocky relationship between the Toronto Police Service and the gay community. Uh, we can go back 40 years to the, um, to the bathhouse raids and, and certainly numerous examples beyond that. Do you think that that rocky relationship had something to do with them not seeing what you were seeing? 
Absolutely. But and I think some people have characterized that as just flatly saying that the police are homophobic and that that's what hobbled investigators. And I don't really think that's fair. I don't think it's quite accurate. I think it's a much more complex picture than that. I mean, you know, you're talking about a community and a, you know, an arm of the government that have been at odds for decades. Um, the Toronto Police Service, like many other police services across the country and across the world, had consistently used law enforcement as a tool to target, harass, surveil, arrest, and criminalize the queer community, like you said, going back 40, 50 years. You know, that was used to raid bathhouses, to you know, arrest folks in their own home. In some cases, you know, there are stories of officers picking up queer people from uh, the, the gay village, driving them down to the Portlands, roughing them up, stealing their shoes, and forcing them to walk home. You know, these are the sort of experiences a lot of queer people had with the police, you know, right from the 60s, 70s, up until the 2000s in many respects. So a lot of that came along into this investigation. Now, I truly believe the Toronto Police investigators and detectives who worked this case genuinely wanted to cooperate with the folks in the village, genuinely wanted to solve these cases. But what you had was a fundamental mistrust, a longstanding and deep-seated you know, misapprehension about the mission of the Toronto Police Service, and an unwillingness, I think, to be maybe as cooperative as they could have been. That being said, a lot of folks in the village went into the police station, went into these detachments, went into interviews with police and spilled their guts out, you know, offered everything they knew that could have been helpful to this investigation. They went above and beyond in terms of revealing details about their own sex life, details about their own you know, personal uh, relationships. And ultimately, some of that information pointed to Bruce MacArthur, the man responsible for all of this. And police, unfortunately, weren't able to you know, put all of those dots together and ultimately make the arrest when they, when they probably could or should have. Hmm. So there's a lot of sociological sort of um, you know, community the mistrust that goes uh, into this failure, essentially. For sure. Let, let's play a clip right now. I want to go back to just a little over three years ago. Mark Saunders was the then chief of the Toronto Police Service. The issue of a serial killer came up, and here's what he had to say. Sheldon, the clip, please. I know that there's uh, obviously you don't want to create public panic, but is there any reason for you to say definitively that there is not a, a, a serial killer that is in that area? We follow the evidence, Travis, and the evidence is telling us that that's not the case right now. So if the evidence changes, that if the evidence changes, that's another day. But the evidence today tells us that there is not uh, a serial killer based on the evidence that's involved. I'd like to know what went through your head when you heard the chief say that. It was jarring, I think, at the time. So at that point, we had had the three disappearances between 2010 and 2012, and we'd had two more disappearances in 2017. Again, five men, all with ties to the village, um, you know, all who fit a pretty neat profile. And the police repeatedly insisted that it was, it was you know, panic or paranoia um, that explained people's calls for this to be treated as a serial killer investigation. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, maybe the chief knew more than he was letting on and he didn't want to tip off Bruce MacArthur. But actually, you know, in investigating this book, I've learned that police genuinely did not believe they had a serial killer right up until the days before the arrest in early January 2018. Police really were of the opinion that Bruce MacArthur was only responsible for a single homicide. So it it was really, in, in reporting out this book, it was stark to me the fact that police refused to accept the possibility or the likelihood of a serial killer right up until the final days where they finally had that smoking gun evidence that confirmed what I think a lot of people in the village have been saying for years, which is, you know, people don't disappear in this way. These cases were connected. And unfortunately, they were right. I want to ask you about the relationship between the police and the media, because it is a, it is on the one hand occasionally confrontational, but it is on the other hand symbiotic. You know, the, the, the media need the police and the police need the media uh, to get the word out and to, you know, garner public attention to help them perhaps see evidence, see witnesses and so on and so forth. How did you negotiate that, that occasional push-pull of that relationship? 
it, it's complicated to say the least. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's fair to say that you know the Toronto Police Service is not always receptive to critical reporting. You know, I reported out this story for Vice as well as you know McLean's, uh, ultimately the Globe and Mail, the CBC, and of course working on this book, and it was tough sometimes, you know, to get real callbacks or real confirmation of, of things we were reporting. And other times, you know, I can tell you that many of the officers involved in this case are far more media friendly than many other officers I've dealt with in the Toronto Police Service. Uh, Detective Sergeant Hank Atsinga, who is the, the head of this investigation, you know, was more willing than I think I've ever seen an officer, you know, an active duty officer in Canada to call up um, reporters and to, you know, hand over information and to, to be accessible to you know tough questions and I really appreciated that um, but I think at the chief's level there was an effort to control information there was an effort to in many ways gaslight both the media and the community about legitimate fears and legitimate questions I mean at one point you heard uh, Chief Saunders suggest that it was the community's fault for not coming forward with critical information. He did that in an interview with the Globe and Mail. Well, and, and when the Globe and Mail published those comments, he tried to allege the Globe was fabricating or taking out of context his comments, which I think was absolutely unacceptable. And what's even more you know, galling for me is that the chief knew when he made those comments that investigators actually had gotten tips from the community about Bruce MacArthur. And in fact, they had even interviewed him in 2013. So it's frustrating to watch the police service proclaim that it wants to be accessible and accountable to the media and to the public, when in some respects, it tries to obfuscate and control information in that respect and then deny when it's called out on it. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, to say the least. Hmm. Let's do an excerpt from the book here. Sheldon, if you want to bring up this graphic, we'll do this excerpt from Justin Ling's book. Bruce MacArthur's victims were vulnerable in similar ways. They were marginalized because the police spent so many decades marginalizing the entire community. Individual detectives may have treated this case with all the seriousness and empathy it required, but that can't undo every other homophobic remark from someone in uniform, every morality raid on a gay bar, every queer person who died in police custody, every trans homicide that was allowed to go unsolved. More than that, his victims faced trauma that helped create narratives to explain away their disappearance. War, torture, violence, illness, assault, those experiences shaped these men's lives and may have contributed to their mental health struggles and substance abuse. But it should not have meant that their disappearances deserved less public scrutiny or concern from the police. In your view, Justin, what does all that say about the nature of the police service in Ontario's capital city? I think it says that the whole system is in many respects broken. And I mean, this is something I think we're grappling with, not just in Toronto, but across the country and across North America. There is a fundamental mismatch between our public safety institutions and the community who are most at risk and who need that help the most. You know, there's a real conversation being had about the ways in which communities like racialized communities, indigenous communities and queer communities are often in, in very contradictory ways, over-policed but under-protected. You know, you're more likely to get picked up for dealing drugs or, or having drugs in your person or for sex work or for homelessness or for vagrancy or for, you know, small uh, crimes that really don't matter in the grand scheme of things in terms of public safety. You're more likely to get picked up and arrested and prosecuted for those things if you're racialized, if you're Indigenous, if you're in the village, say. But you're also, in many respects, less likely to have your disappearance your homicide or your assault solved. So what does that say about our institutions? That the very people we we recognize are the most targeted and vulnerable are also the ones who are most harassed and targeted by the police, but also who are least protected. That is a fundamental problem that we have not grappled with in a fulsome enough way. And I mean, this is not new. In the book, I go back to the 1970s and 80s to show that um, even as the bathhouse raids were happening, even as this harassment of the community was happening, homicides against queer people were skyrocketing and going unsolved at a rate significantly higher than the rest of the community. So the parallels to 
modern day, I think, are really staggering. Also consider the fact that, you know, as men were still going missing from the Church in Wellesley Village, there were morality raids happening happening on parks targeting men who were, you know, hooking up in the bushes, essentially. So you have to ask yourself, why was it that we didn't have adequate resources investigating missing persons cases, but we had plenty of resources to send undercover cops into bushes to arrest people who were, frankly, doing nothing wrong? So it is a real conversation that's happening right now around defunding the police, and I think it's a good one. But it also has to be about reallocating resources away from drug busts and prostitution stings and morality policing towards the actual public safety mandate that we need to be fulfill, uh, fulfilling and ensuring that homicide and missing persons cases don't get ignored, don't go unsolved, and don't become cold cases. Well, at the risk of incurring your wrath, let me ask the follow-up that the chief may or may not have hinted at in the interview that he gave with the Globe and Mail which is, is the relationship or has the relationship between the police and the community been so bad that the community has not been as helpful or as forthcoming with tips and leads to the police as perhaps other communities might be? I don't know. I'm asking the question. It is a fair question, and I think there's some truth to it. I think when you put it on the community, you have to ask, well, why aren't they coming forward? Why are they skeptical? Why are they hesitant? And in some respects, you know, I've spoken to people who probably had useful information about, you know, this investigation, who had been ignored or belittled or seemingly kind of cast aside when they came forward with information about an assault or about a sexual assault. So, it, you know, you have to pull apart the reasons why someone might not be willing to come, you know, hand over information. It's not because there's some sort of innate hatred of police in the queer community. That would be absurd. There's a reason why that distrust exists. That being said, like I said earlier, there were a lot of people with information who volunteered it despite risk to themselves. They, they over came that mistrust, that apprehension. And in the end, that information was extremely valuable. I've spoken to people who are no great fans of the Toronto Police Service, who went into a detachment to say, listen, the last time I saw my friend was with a guy named Bruce MacArthur. And that was in 2013. So you really have to ask the question, why is it the, the chief insisted on making those remarks? I think in many respects, you can... Uh, not just make the inference, I'll say it outright. I think the chief was trying to shift blame away from his own service, which failed, onto the community, which was failed. I think that's really galling, and I don't think the chief ever properly owned up to that reality. The chief was on your program just a couple of months ago, kind of shrugging off the idea that the community was not terribly fond of him, saying, well, in the streets, some people like me, some people don't like me, what are you going to do? That is such a blasé attitude to to put on the community the failings of your institution. He should have been asking for penance. He should have been actually apologizing. And I'll note, just while I'm on my rant here, when the chief, quote unquote, apologized for the bathhouse raids in 1981, he never said, I'm sorry. He said mistakes were made, and he said we wouldn't do it today and all that. He never, and this, a queer activist pointed this out to me, he never said the word sorry. I'm not sure he is sorry. I still hear from officers who defend the bathhouse raids, who think it was worthwhile, who think that the community was in the wrong. So I think there has to be a lot more introspection at the top level of the Toronto Police Service. I know there's a lot of introspection happening on the lower levels on for individual officers, individual investigators. They are actually confronting some of the issues at play here. I think they're doing a great job of it. I think you have to start asking why the chief and the higher-ups aren't doing the same. I have asked this question of other people who have covered really horrendous stories over the years, be it the Bernardo murders or the Picton case or, or others. And, um, and I'm curious as to what your answer will be to it, so I'm going to put it to you. What kind of emotional toll does it take on you to report this story and write a very good book about it? I, it undoubtedly takes a toll. I mean, I can tell you that... You know, there were times writing this book where I had to stand up and walk away because I was bawling, right? I was I couldn't stop crying at certain at certain circumstances. You know, there are parts of this book that still fill me with tears, right? You know, there are realities of these men's lives that are absolutely heartbreaking. That being said, I think, you know, I was in a good 
place to write this book. You know, I, I was not the one personally affected by this investigation. I spoke to people who were involved with this, who had to deal with their friend's disappearance in 2010, who had to deal with the reopening of the investigation in 2013, who had to deal with me harassing them in 2015 and 2016 and 2017, who had to deal with the case being reopened in 2017, who had to deal with the arrest in 2018, the trial in 2019, and now the external review that's going on in 2020. For them, this has been a decade. And I can't even, you know, I, I in some respects, I don't even like talking about what told Sagan on me because it is nothing compared to the unthinkable trauma and pain and hurt that has been experienced by so many people in the community and in these men's lives for the last decade. So, you know, I think it, what this book has taught me is that we need to have a better conversation about how we take care of those people, right? Because that it's really hard for these folks get, to get back to a regular life, to find employment, because a lot of the times they, they now have, you know, m you know, income issues to look after their, their kids and, and their family members, you know, to go about their daily lives. And there's not a lot of support for them, to be totally honest. Our society doesn't think a lot about folks who have had to go through this. There are no consistent, constant, and dedicated supports for them, then I think that's an, it's a real shame. I think there really ought to be some level of support network for these people. And really, outside of the court system, in some respects, and, and in some cases, the police, there really isn't. Well, you've done a real service spending the time you did getting this book uh, published and getting this story to the public. So congratulations to you for doing it. Missing from the Village, the story of serial killer Bruce MacArthur, the search for justice and the system that failed Toronto's queer community. Justin Ling, it's good of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, October 28th, 2020. Last month, Barbados announced it would no longer have Queen Elizabeth as its head of state. Tomorrow, a conversation about whether Canada should follow suit and leave the monarchy behind. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.